Formed in Sheffield, England in 1977, Def Leppard would become associated with a new wave of British heavy metal that rose to popularity in the late 70s and early 80s. While the group would go on to become one of the most successful rock bands of all time, they would be marred by personal tragedies that also hampered their creative output. They would only release five albums in their first 15 years together. Today, let's talk about the life and death of guitarist Steve Clark, who would go on to write some of Def Leppard's most memorable hits, while at the same time putting the band through some of their most turbulent times. Born to a Sheffield taxicab driver, guitarist Steve Clark would first pick up the guitar at the age of 11, getting into classical music. But it would be Led Zeppelin who gave Clark a clear picture of the type of music that he wanted to play, according to his memorial site with him saying, and I quote, I used to listen to the radio, watch TV, and hear groups all the time, and I knew that I wanted to make music, but I wasn't sure exactly what kind of music until I heard Jimmy Page. I heard the first Led Zeppelin album at a friend's house, and that was it. I have to have an electric. That was what I wanted to do. It was at the age of 17 in 1978 that he met another guitarist named Pete Willis, who was playing in a band named Def Leppard, and invited the young guitarist to audition for the group as they were looking for a second guitar player. Def Leppard frontman Joe Elliott remembered his first jam with Clark, recalling to louder sound. He picked up his Les Paul copy from his guitar case and put it on way too low. Just remember thinking, aye aye, this looks good. He had this long blonde hair and denim jacket, skinny as a rake and wearing white clogs like Brian May or Brian Robertson. He played Leonard Skinner's Freebird and did the whole end bit on his own. It was like, holy crap, this guy's great. He had this slightly sleazy sound, so he was very complimentary to the studded funkier style of Pete Willis. It was instant. I remember telling Steve, look, you've got the gig. Then Pete said, hang on, don't you think we should discuss this first? So I went, absolutely not. So you want to lose this guy for somebody else? Are you kidding? He would ask. Clark initially threatened to quit the band early on unless they stopped rehearsing and started playing some live shows, which they eventually did. Clark would prove to be a prolific songwriter, penning some of the band's biggest hits and writing nearly 90% of their songs during his time with the band. He seemed to be the missing piece for the band as they went on to nab their first recording deal in 1979 with Polygram and their debut album On Through the Night proved to be a hit in the UK and America peaking at number 51 on the Billboard charts. They would soon tour alongside rock rates like ACDC and Ted Nugent, and the band was hailed as part of the new wave of British heavy metal, but to the members themselves, they detested that label, not seeing much similarity to bands like themselves and Saxon and Iron Maiden. Def Leppard, for their part, would draw in more pop and glam influences, including groups like T-Rex and Queen. Def Leppard would release their second record High and Dry in 1981, but as the band's star began to rise, so did tensions within the group. Clark's alcohol abuse only worsened. Perhaps his father, with whom he had a strained relationship, was part of the reason he hit the bottle so hard, with guitarist Phil Collin writing in his book, in a way Steve didn't have much choice in the matter. He was surrounded by drink most of his life. Steve's dad was a taxi driver, and I think Steve was always trying to prove he was worthy of his rock star status. Steve had to prove his manhood to his dad all the time, that he had the values of a Sheffield steelworker underneath his golden splendor. By the early 80s, Clark began to butt heads with Pete Willis, who was ironically also a heavy drinker, with frontman Joe Elliott telling louder sound. By the time we were touring in 1981, Steve couldn't even stand to be in the same room as Pete, because Pete would always be the one who used up all the towels whenever he had a shower, and things like that. When Pete had to go, there weren't any great protests from anybody in the band. Ironically, Pete would be let go by the band due to his drinking problem. It was now 1983 and guitarist Phil Collin would join the group, and while Clark was intimidated by his guitar playing at first, they soon bonded and came up with their trademark dual guitar sound. Apart from their musical relationship, the pair bonded outside of the studio and stage, largely due to their penchant for alcohol, partying, playing pranks, and deep conversations. The pair became known as the Terror Twins. Colin would write in his autobiography, Adrenalize, We quickly became best friends. It wasn't just the guitar playing or extreme boozing. We both found that we were soaking up all that we could and learning more on the road than we could ever learn at school with a healthy appetite for new and exciting cultural discoveries. We also found that we loved each other's company. We could get into deep conversations that would last for hours, he would write. The group's third studio album, Pyromania, which was released in 1983, would be their first album with new guitarist Phil Collin. It would prove to be the biggest album of the group's career, led in part by the singles Photograph, Foolin' and Rock of Ages. The band's next release, Hysteria, wouldn't come until 1987, 
And the album was long delayed due to a tragic car accident that saw drummer Rick Allen lose his arm and become lost in his own world of addiction. But Allen would persevere on, learning to drum with one arm and having a special electronic drum kit built for him. Despite their similar life circumstances, Allen became isolated from Clark's turmoil telling Rolling Stone, I was involved enough with my own problems with drugs and alcohol. Whenever I tried to talk to Steve about his situation, he'd come back at me with, what about you? I found it difficult to get through that barrier, and the last thing I wanted to say to him was, I lost my arm. I got through all that. I conquered it because I wouldn't have been honest. At that time, I don't think I really had conquered it. I almost felt like I found out about Steve a bit too late to help him in the way that he deserved. Despite the turmoil around the making of the album, Hysteria would go on to be Def Leppard's biggest album of their career, topping the charts in America. By 1987, Clark's terror twin Phil Collin had gotten sober, with Joe Elliott telling Louder Sound, they never fell out, but Steve lost his drinking buddy and became a lot more isolated. Clark's substance abuse only grew worse, making his behavior more volatile and less predictable. Bassist Rick Savage would tell Rolling Stone, he would begin to hate the things that he loved most because he felt tied to them. He was always the one who wanted to get out of the studio and on the road, but when we were in Glen Falls, New York, rehearsing for the big American tour, the one that he always wanted, he tried to smash his hand in the bathroom of his hotel room because he didn't want to do it. In December of 1989, Clark was found lying in a gutter with a blood alcohol level of 0.59. He would be admitted to a psychiatric hospital in Minnesota with Elliot recalling to Rolling Stone. That didn't mean anything to us, referring to his blood alcohol level, until they explained that 0.41 killed John Bonham. The doctor that was treating Clark asked his bandmates to pen letters to the struggling guitarist, explaining how concerned they were about him, but the effort proved futile. Elliot would tell Rolling Stone, I actually believe that we lost him then. Mutt Lang, our producer, turned around to me when Steve left the room after we'd done all the letter bit, and he said, he's got a dead man's skin. He was right. His skin was like orange peel, that texture. He looked great other than that. He was skinny, had his cowboy boots and jeans. His hair was brilliant, but you looked close up at his face and he looked like a guy that was dead. It was following his stay in the hospital that Clark was given six months off from the group to straighten out his life with a promise that he'd be welcomed back into the band. He would attend rehab in Tucson, Arizona, where he met another patient, a recovering heroin addict named Janie Dean, with whom he fell in love with, and the couple soon got engaged. They made a pact following their stint in rehab to keep each other on the straight and narrow, but both of them quickly fell off the wagon. On January 8, 1991, the guitarist was found unresponsive on the couch in the couple's home by his fiance, and his death would be attributed to a lethal combination of alcohol and prescription drugs including Valium and Codeine, with Colin writing in his autobiography, he had been drinking and he cracked a rib earlier on. The doctor told him not to drink while he was taking his pain medication. He drank anyway. The coroner's report, I believe, read that it was due to the swelling of the brain, he would write. Def Leppard's album Adrenalize had been stalled for two years up until this point, and it was following the guitarist's death that they were able to wrap up work on the record, albeit as a four-piece. The task of recreating the band's two-guitar sound would fall on the shoulders of Phil Collin with them recalling the louder sound, we had recorded demos on multi-track, so it was really easy for me to get inside that. I was sitting there with him when he played the original parts. I could relay that, but it was like playing along to a ghost. When you hear that original track and there he is, it feels like he's alive. It's really weird, a very strange sensation he'd recall. While the news of his death still shocked the members of the band, it also came as a surprise with Savage telling Rolling Stone, Joe said to me sometime afterward that it was almost like having an elderly grandma you know is going to die sometime, but you don't think it's going to be today. According to BackseatMafia.com, it was following the guitarist's death that the tabloids started publishing stories that Clark had been feuding with his father over money. Clark would eventually be replaced in the lineup by Vivian Campbell, who's still in Def Leppard to this very day. As for Clark's fiancée, Janie Dean, she would die a few years later due to substance abuse. Colin would look back at his departed bandmate telling Louder Sound, I remember how record producer Mud Lang summed up Steve one time. He said, give me the thinker over the player any day. That was Steve. Mutt said there are a million session sausages. That's what he called session players, but they have no ideas. They're clinical. But Steve, he was a thinker, as a player and as a man. There was a lot going on in Steve, unfortunately sometimes a bit too much. Steve was a work in progress. It's very easy to talk about this after someone has passed away, but Steve really did have a lot more left to say. Steve was on his path to discovery, and booze put an end to that. If the drinking had just been a phase, if he'd come out of it, it would have been wonderful. In 2019, when Def Leppard was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Clark would be included posthumously. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. We'll see you again on Rock and Roll True Stories. Take care.